Hello, I'm Brad Neal with the University of Indianapolis, and today we're going to be talking about material from chapter two in the textbook. So let's go ahead and let's get started. So the assigned readings uh, that this video is going to be going over are the molecules and ionic compounds, as well as the chemical nomenclature section of the OpenStax uh, Chemistry 2 second edition uh, textbook. So that's sections 2.6 and 2.7 in the book. Do make sure that you read those before you watch this video. The video will then make a bit more sense. So before we get into some of the more specifics, I kind of wanted to give everybody a little bit of context about why we're talking about this stuff and uh, where it's coming from. And the main point of context here is that we have to have a way as chemists to describe the kinds of interactions that atoms are having, be, having between one another when they're in a formula or a compound. Um, and so we're going to describe those uh, interactions as chemical bonds. Now the bonds we say hold atoms together and the bonds are actually the way that the electrons between different species interact with one another. And by species here, I mean the different atoms. So an ionic bond is going to occur uh, between a metal and a non-metal. So this requires you to go on your periodic table and we're gonna talk about that here in a second. But the key thing behind an ionic bond is that, uh, at least here in general chemistry one, we're going to have the formalism that an electron from one of our atoms is going to be transferred to the other atom. And so if we have an electron going from one neutral atom to another neutral atom, one will have lost an electron, making it now an ion. The other one will gain an electron, making it an anion, or making it an ion, an anion specifically, because it's negatively charged. When this happens, we say ionic compounds have been formed. So an ionic compound is going to be something that uh, you're going to be able to tell whether a species is ionic or not if you have a metal plus a non-metal. A covalent bond, however, is going to occur between two non-metals. Um, and electrons are going to be shared between our atoms. Um, so in the case of an ionic species, we have that formalism of an electron is definitively given from one atom to the next. Here we're going to say, well, actually, uh, one atom just shares electrons with the other atom that it is forming a bond to. So nobody truly gains, nobody really loses, they're just sharing. Um, so you can think about uh, an ionic bond and like in a joke world as being uh, very capitalistic in terms of, hey, you buy thing, it takes money, money exchanges, and then you go your own separate ways. You now have thing, they have money. So a formal exchange has occurred. Whereas in a covalent bond, you could say it's socialism and that everybody shares and shares alike. That's a gross misrepresentation in terms of politics. Um, but there you go. So this is your periodic table, in case you didn't know that. Um, the periodic table that you usually look up will look something like this. So it's going to give you a lot of information that we've talked about previously. So specifically, it's going to give you your period down the periodic table. It's going to give you your, your group as you go across the periodic table. I'm sorry, your period as you go across, your group as you go down. My bad. Um, groups go down, periods go across, just so we're all clear here. The periodic table gives you your average atomic mass, um, lots of things, your atomic number, lots of things. Now, a lot of your periodic tables will also have a little color code where they're going to say, okay, these uh, substances are um, metal if they're one color or shaded one color, and then it's a solid liquid gas. For our course, this is the approximate rule of thumb that you can use. Um, this is not the world's best rule of thumb, but it's a general rule of thumb. Everything here in blue, we're going to be thinking about behaving as a metal. The stuff that's in purple, we're going to say is a non-metal, and the stuff in green are the metalloids. So when we say for an ionic compound, it's a metal with a non-metal, what we're saying is, is, it, is there a species that's here in blue 
mixing with a species that's here in purple. And if we have a compound that has something in blue plus something in purple, then we likely have an ionic compound. Um, whereas if we have only species that are in purple interacting with other species that are in purple, then we would say, okay, we have a covalent compound. Uh, we're having only covalent bonding occur. Now, very rightfully, you should be asking, what about the blue, or I'm sorry, what about the green? The green for general chemistry, um, a lot of times boron and maybe silicon you're going to see as behaving um, as a covalent compound, but you also can see silicon and some of these uh, and these other ones behaving in an ionic compound fashion. Um, so that's going to be a thing that you, from your reading from your previous section about the periodic table and those metalloids, metals, and non-metals, that should make sense why they can behave uh, kind of weirdly. But for naming, to get ourselves used to things, we're going to mostly be focusing on uh, the stuff that's here in blue and the stuff that's here in purple, just so that we get uh, the repetitions in necessary to get good at this stuff. Okay, like I said, those vertical columns or groups might also call them a family. The ones of note, your alkaline metals. Okay, so it's group 1A. Why is that important? Um, yeah, it's very reactive, um, but they typically are going to form a plus one cation. That's just something you have to know. You're in group 1A, your alkaline metals, plus one cation. Alkali earth, group 2A, the second group there going down left to right, they're going to form plus two cations. Your noble gases, to skip here are normally not going to be very reactive. Uh, later in the semester, we might show you a couple examples where it's been uh, possible to have them react, um, but for right now, don't really worry about those. Halogens, 7A. So if we go back here, your halogens, uh, this column right here, the fluorine, chlorine, bromine, iodine, actinine, that's what we're gonna say are, are our halogens. When they form ions, they will no formally form a negative charge, a single negative charge species. Since it's negatively charged, we call it an anion. A positively charged species is going to be called a cation. The chalcogens, 6A, are so oxygen, sulfur, those are the two biggies that you're really going to need to know for general chemistry one. Um, they're typically going to form a negative two charge. Um, and because they have that negative two charge, they have two extra electrons compared to their proton count. We're going to call them anions. Now, table 2.5 has this table that's in your book. And yeah, it's really small, but you can look it up in your book. Um, these are what we call our polyatomic ions. The polyatomics mean it takes up many different atoms to form the ionic species. So uh, if you can see here, we have something at the very top of it called ammonium. So what it ammonium is, is nitrogen plus four hydrogens coming together. And the overall that species has a positive one charge. The play that I suggest you all doing right now with this is just memorize this list. This is the thing to do here. Memorize this list of polyatomic ions. Um, in fact, on the quiz number three, you are going to be quizzed over this list of polyatomic ions. I'm going to give you five of these at random, so it's going to be randomly generated, which five I ask you about, and you are either going to give me the name or the formula. You're going to give me whichever one I don't give you. The reason I'm asking you to memorize these is it just will save you so much time down the road if you're not having to constantly look this kind of information up. This is just kind of a basics kind of thing. It's like trying to memorize your ABCs. You do it so that you don't have to fret about having to look up all the letters in the alphabet for the rest of your life. This is kind of a basic for chemistry. So please check out table 2.5. If you're in table 2.5, you're gonna notice that there are two more columns to, down the other side of it. Um, and those are gonna be about uh, commonly, uh, common 
uh, I believe it's acids that you can form from these polyatomic ions. Don't worry about that for the quiz. Just worry about this list that you're seeing here, just the polyatomic ions and their formulas. Okay, so we've set the stage now for naming. So now it's time to go over the rules. In a separate video, I will present to you a bunch of examples for implementing these rules and talking through the decision-making process. Right now, we're gonna be focusing in on what are the rules, why do they make sense, um, or if they never make sense, just what are they because we can't change them, we just have to accept them. So the first one we're gonna go over is probably our easiest naming rule, and that is our um, binary ionic compounds. Now sometimes you'll refer, sometimes people will refer to this as a type one species. Cool. Um, I'm not worried that you know that part of it. I am worried that you're able to just name the compounds. So maybe you can't name what exact naming rule you're supposed to be using as long as you can actually get the thing named correctly. That's what I care about at the end of the day. So what species will we find that follow this rule set? We're only going to have metals from group one and group two with three exceptions. But group one and group two metals, that's what will follow this. So if you have a compound that the, it has no metals whatsoever, you will not follow these naming rules. That species or that compound does not get named via this methodology. If you have a metal and the metal is in the transition metals, you will not use this naming convention here. If your compound has a metal and it's in group one or group two, you are going to use this naming convention. Only with group one and group two. Now I said that there's three other species. You're gonna do this for aluminum, boron, and now uh, silver. Aluminum, boron, and silver. Those are the three exceptions. Um, if you see those metals as your cation, you're going to use this rule set. So what is the rules? The rules are when you are naming a species, you always put the cation first and the anion second. So metal name goes first, then the anion's name goes second, always. So a monoatomic cation, AKA, that means an anion that only come, is only made up of one atom, one type of atom, one type of atom. So group one or group two or boron or aluminum or silver. Those are your monoatomic cations. You're going to use the name from the, of the element. That's going to be the name that we give the cation. So just whatever it is on the periodic table for your cation, boom, that's it. Now for the anion, that's gonna be the non-metal part of your name. You're gonna take the root of the element name, you're gonna take a, off the ending part, and the ending is going to be replaced with IDE. So I can already tell somebody out there's got a question about it, so let's go ahead and let's do an example. So, the first example then we would wanna use is something off of that first part of the periodic table. So let's use potassium. Potassium. Okay. Potassium is there in group one. It has the symbol K. Now let's say that we are trying to do what the rule set showed us. And the rule set said, oops, rule set, rule set says we're trying to name a formula. Okay, so cation goes first, anion goes second. So we are going to put the metal out in front of the anion, the anion being the non-metal. What non-metal would we be working with? Well, in this case, let's make it easy on ourselves, and let's say it's Cl. Okay, 
you're looking at the CL and you're saying, okay, I go to my periodic table and I see that CL is chlorine. Yep. Except remember on the rule set what we said, we're going to take off the ending and we're going to replace it with IDE. So that means we go over to the chlorine, we take off the INE and we put IDE. So it'd be chloride. What the world? Chloride. There we go. So the name of KCl is potassium space chloride using those naming rules. Let's do another example. Let's do BaO. So we're given our chemical formula here. We can go to our periodic table. We can see the Ba is barium. What do you do with a dead chemist? Barium. So barium, and now we look on our periodic table, we see the oxygen, that's going to be oxygen. Okay, so we're gonna take off the ending. We're only gonna stick with the root. The root for oxygen is admittedly a little funny, comparatively. It means taking off the entire Y-G-E-N. So the name would be barium space oxide. And that's our easiest rule by far. Um, again, you can only follow this um, naming convention if you have a metal that's in group one or group two. What happens if you have a metal though that is not in group one or group two? Okay, AKA transition metals or uh, one of our lanthanide, lanthanon, lanthanoid, actinoid, actinide, potato, potato series. Binary ion compounds type two. The trick about this is there are certain metals, especially those transition metals, that have more than one kind of positive charge. Um, because they can have more than one kind of positive charge, whenever we write out the name of that metal, after the name, we're gonna use Roman numerals to denote what is the charge of the metal. Because there's a difference between metal, or I'm sorry, there's a difference between tin and a four plus charge state, so it's lost four electrons, versus tin that has lost two electrons would be tin two plus. So tin four plus or tin two plus, they behave differently. They have different chemical properties. So when we write out the name, we're gonna make sure that we use Roman numerals to tell our readers what the charge is for any metal that can have more than one um, positive ion, positive cationic state. You remember our three exceptions, the boron, aluminum, and silver? The reason that they are, are our exceptions is because silver will always be in a plus one state Silver will always be in a plus one state. Silver will always be in a plus one state. If I've said it three times, it's really important. Aluminum will always be in a plus three state. Aluminum will be in a plus three state. Aluminum will be in a plus three state. And your boron is also going to be in that plus three state. And that's it. They're always going to have those charges never going to change even though they might be on a part of the periodic table where you think oh they could have multiple different oxidation states they don't they only have those now there was this old school naming convention that i'm going to briefly show you um and maybe you had classes before that made you name things in that old school naming structure where you would put an ick or an us ending on a metal we're not we're not going to do that in this class. Uh, I'm just highlighting it here to say that, yeah, it exists, but we're not going to do that. If you did write out the elements in their old names, um, then or those ions in their old names, you wouldn't have to use the Roman numerals. 
But since we're not going to do that, you're going to need to always be using your Roman numerals. So again, here's your periodic table, but now we have a very, very abbreviated form of it. Um, and it shows a bunch of our metals and our non-metals and the uh, charge states that they prefer to form. This is not an exhaustive list. There's so many more charge states by so many of the elements that aren't listed here. This is just to try to highlight to you that your copper and can be in a plus one or a plus two state. Oh, for the record, zinc is like 99% of the time going to be in this plus two state. And so will cadmium. Um, so if you're going to add those to your list of exceptions along with silver and aluminum and boron, I think you're probably good to go to do that. So briefly then here are the old school names that we use with our transition metals. Um, so like copper one would be cuprous, copper two would be cupric because whichever of our species had the lower charge state would get the lower oxidation state would get the OUS ending. So um, plus one for the copper cuprous versus the plus two would get the cupric, the ick because it's higher oxidation state. The reason that this was a bad idea was um, take a look at iron. Iron has a plus two and a plus three. Well, the plus two on the iron is ferrous, but the plus two on the copper is cupric. They have different endings. They're not violating the rule though because iron has a higher oxidation state of plus three. So it would be ferric based off of the definitions and the rule set. As you can tell, this gets a little confusing. We're not going to do it. Okay, before we go into hydrates, let's very quickly uh, do a binary ionic compound naming example. Just one of them, though. All right. So if we write up here for ourselves a compound, so now we need something. Um, that is on the, or that is a transition metal. And so let's say specifically that we've got something like, uh, let's see here, let's not do that. Let's do it a little easier. Okay, you see something that looks like this and you go on your periodic table and you see that this is tin. Tin is in our transition metals. So it, is one of those species that we're not sure what its charge state is because it can have multiple ones. So we know that we're supposed to put some kind of Roman numeral here, but we're not sure what it is yet. Not just by reading the chemical formula as written. We have to actually do a little bit of math to figure this out. So if we have the 10 Cl4, I'm rewriting that over here because I'm gonna do my math off to the side. The 10 chloride actually gives us all the information we need to solve this problem. So first off, the thing that we need to realize is there is no charge that was listed up here. So this thing that we started with, I don't know what happened there, okay. This 10, the 10 chloride, the 10 Cl4, that is a neutral compound. So the overall charge is going to be zero. Now for the 10, we don't know what its charge is gonna be. So I'm gonna put that as X here in a set of parentheses. I don't know what its charge is, but I do know that I've only got one of them. The reason that I know I've only got one of them is because the 10 has no subscript behind it. Because my overall charge of my compound is neutral, it's that zero out here, the charge of my cation plus the charge of my anion combined must equal zero. That's what I'm gonna to use to solve this problem. I can use my 
chloride, which going to my periodic table, I see it's a non-metal, specifically it's a halogen. I'm gonna then know it's gonna have a negative one charge to it. The four behind the chloride is gonna tell me I have four total of these negative one charges. I've now set up the math problem necessary to know what my charge of my tin will be. So I can solve for X, X is gonna equal a positive four. So instead of writing out 10 question mark right here, I can go ahead and rewrite my name and I'm writing it in lowercase right now because 10 and all metals aren't proper nouns. So there's no reason unless it's the beginning of the sentence to use the capital. Um, in fact, don't use a capital letter unless it is at the beginning of a sentence because it's not a proper noun. 10, four. So I put the Roman numeral in and like we discussed, the chlorine gets that IDE ending. So I would read this out and say, I have 10, four chloride. That's the name of this species using that rule set for binary ionic compounds. Hydrates. Hydrates, it turns out, are very uh, easy to name. A hydrate is going to, nine times out of ten for this course, be um, an, it's going to be a covalent, or I'm sorry, it's going to be an ionic compound, and it's going to have a metal plus a non-metal. So this entire first part, this magnesium sulfate, we would name that based off of the naming rules. Now, the one trick on this particular example is that we've got the magnesium, which is in group 2A on your periodic table. Go ahead, I'll wait while you check that out and verify that. Okay, so the magnesium is in a plus two state, typically. The sulfate, the SO4, we have to have our polyatomic ions memorized. Remember those things I said you need to have memorized? This is one of them. SO4 always forms the polyatomic ion sulfate with a negative two charge. So that's where I get the name magnesium sulfate from because I recognize the SO4 is gonna have that specific name because it's a polyatomic ion. To write out a hydrate, you then put a big dot, like this like big old dot that you see right here. And then you're going to write a number that's in front of it like this superscript or I'm sorry, it's not a superscript, this number out in front that's gonna be the same regular script size as the water written out. So seven H2O, and that's water. The way we would read this would be seven waters of hydration or magnesium sulfate heptahydrate. So the ionic compound gets named the exact same way as all uh, using the previous rules for ionic compounds, we're just now adding in the water part of it. Binary covalent compounds. Okay, so you could say that these are type three. Now it's a covalent compound. That means we're dealing with species that are exclusively coming from the non-metals portion of our periodic table. It's really not bad, the rule set here. So the first thing that we would do is we use the first element in the formula is going to get the name that is written out on the periodic table. The second element in our formula is going to be named as though it were an anion. It's not an anion. We're just naming it that way. Now, differently though than our metals, we're going to have to use prefixes if and when they are appropriate. So if we have multiple numbers of atoms, be they the cat, or I'm sorry, multiple numbers of uh, yeah, our atoms, whether it be the first element or the second element, we're going to need to write out a prefix to denote to the reader how many of that species we actually have. So let's go ahead and let's do an example here. Um, the 
A possible example would be something like um, N2O5. Okay, so this is the chemical formula that is presented to you. The rule set said, name the element, or name the first element as it shows up on the periodic table. So, nitrogen. Name the second element as though it were an anion, oxide. But we're not done because we have to use our prefixes. Now, this species has two nitrogens and five oxygens. The prefix for two is going to be from your reading, di. So di nitrogen, and then for our uh, oxygen here, and I'm gonna have to move this out of the way so that I can actually have space to write it out. It's five will be pent oxide. Now you could say, but it's supposed to be penta oxide. Yeah, but doesn't that kind of sound odd? And in fact, if we go to our naming rules, oops, if we go to our naming rules, we're off, we're going to see that we're often going to drop an O or an A, uh, whenever the element starts out with a prefix. So that way we don't have just kind of weird sounds coming out of our mouths. Um, an example being carbon monoxide instead of carbon monoxide. Strictly speaking, it'd be mono in front of oxide, but monoxide's just kind of odd. Let's just call it monoxide and a good day. So in our previous example of pentoxide, that's why we dropped a vowel. So here's the, a table from the, uh, for the prefixes. Um, where it says for one, it's sometimes omitted. The carbon monoxide, that's the classic example of when it gets omitted. In carbon monoxide, if we go to try to write out from the name the chemical formula, we would see that we've got, so carbon monoxide, the mono, mon, tells us that we have a single oxygen here. The carbon though has no prefix in front of it. And that's because if the first element in the formula, as long as we're dealing with one of these type three binary covalent compounds, if the first element only has a single atom of that element, we don't write out the monocarbon or we don't put the mono prefix in front of it. So carbon monoxide tells us everything we need to know that it's a single carbon and a single oxygen. The mono part does not get written out for the carbon. It does get written out for the oxygen though. If you see prefixes like this, it's a really good indication to you that you're dealing with a compound that is covalent in nature. And so you need to invoke your covalent naming rules. Acids, home stretch. There are so many definitions of what an acid is. We're not getting there right now. What we are going to say for right now, for right now, if you see a compound and the first element in it is H, you need to think acid. Cool. Eventually we'll get into better definitions of what an acid is, but for naming, we're going to be just focusing in on, at this point, the uh, inorganic acids. Um, you see an H in the front, go ahead and think, yep, that's going to be an acid. There's a couple of different types of acids that we'll run into. The first type are ones without oxygen. So this is going to be proton, so H plus, plus some non-metal, but it's only going to be one atom of a non-metal or one kind of atom of a non-metal. Um, no oxygen will be in this species. If you see this kind of example, we're going to use the name of the second element. We're going to turn it into that anion ending. So put, take off the end and put IDE. We're 
going to then put the prefix hydro in front of that name and we're going to take the IDE off and replace it with ick. So for example, if we go to our board here and we write out something like HCl, right off the bat, we have no oxygens present. So we should be thinking that this is going to be following that rule that we just talked about. So we look and we have Cl, which we would think chlorine, which we should then go to chloride. But the acid naming rule tells us get rid of that IDE and what we'll end up with is chloric. But don't forget the prefix part, hydro. So hydrochloric becomes then the root name here. And because it's an acid, we're going to write the word acid as a new word behind it. So HCl, the thought process there is one, no oxygens. Two, we've got a monoatomic anion, the chlorine, which we would say was really chloride in this species. Drop the IDE, replace it with ick, put the hydro out in front, hydrochloric acid. And now <laughs> when it gets a little bit more interesting, and that would be with our oxyanions. So our oxyanions are going to be an anion that does have oxygen and something else with it. Um, your polyatomic ions, that's where we're going to see these oxyanions come into place. Um, that's the humdinger that you need to, again, you have to know what those polyatomic ions are and their names in order to do the acid naming correctly. So an anion that contains an atom of a given element, um, punchline, a lot of these oxy anions are going to come in a series. That means that there's going to be a pair. The one that has a smaller number of oxygen, excuse me, smaller number of oxygen atoms gets the ITE ending. The one with the larger number gets the ATE ending. All right, let's do an example of that. So let's go and let's try out the uh, ch -ch -ch H2SO4 and H2SO3. All right. Going to your polyatomics, you would see that S H2SO4 is sulfate. That's the world's worst bracket. We're not fixing it. You would see the SO. 3, 2 minus is sulfite. When we do our naming, we're going to replace those endings. We're going to replace them differently. 8 becomes ick, I see, and ite becomes us, O U S. So our H2SO4 is going to be sulfuric. And you're like, wait, where did the UR come into play? Yep, that's a good point that you bring out. Nah, I don't got a good answer for you. Sulfuric acid. For the H2SO3, sulfurous acid. That's really bad handwriting. But you get the point. Oh, man, you can't even see it because my head is blocking it. Sulfurous acid. Okay, that's just the application of those rules. The only way you're going to get that naming right is if you have your polyatomics memorized. If you don't have your polyatomics memorized, then there's even if you have the naming rules for your acids memorized, it's not going to matter. Now, 
for the case of if the series contains more than two oxy anions, um, the classic example is our uh, chlorate series. ClO2 minus ClO minus. So each of these is its own individual anion. My challenge for you, sit down with the naming rules here and try to name every one of these anions as a acid, as an acid. Name them using that rule set. That'll let you know if you have a good handle on this oxy anion stuff or not. All right, we've gone through a bunch of rules, shown you a couple examples, but realistically, the only way for you to get good at this stuff is to do practice, practice, practice. Um, and it's kind of like shooting free throws at a basketball goal. If you shoot free, if you shoot a thousand free throws a day, you theoretically should be getting better at free throws. But if you practiced free throw shooting incorrectly a thousand times a day, you're probably not actually going to get any better. So what does the ideal practice scenario look like when you're doing these naming problems? When you do a problem, you want to diagram the problem and you want to ask yourself, what are the pieces of the compound that I'm working with? Am I working with a metal and a non-metal? Am I working with two non-metals? Okay. Figure that part out. And that automatically helps you out a ton. Am I dealing with something that starts with a proton? And then I'm going, dealing with an acid. If you can break down the pieces, then you can ask yourself, okay, what am I supposed to do? In the case of an acid, you follow the rule, the naming convention, and you're pretty well off to the races. Um, you may have to think to yourself, am I dealing with an oxy anion or am I not? If I'm not, then you have those two different rules, the binary or the oxy anion naming structure. Um, in the case of a metal and a non-metal, you have to ask yourself, where are the pieces on the periodic table? Am I dealing with a group one or group two or one of my exception metals where I don't have to use Roman numerals? Or am I dealing with a transition metal? If I've got two non-metals, where are they on the periodic table? Just to make sure that I'm not up to the, that I don't have any weird chicanery that's going to be going on there. Once you know where the pieces are on the periodic table, then you can start thinking about the rule set that goes along with things. So diagram out these problems as you're doing them. If you're having troubles, I'm going to guess it's because one of the things that's not helping you anyways is that you're not stopping and asking yourself these questions really stopping and asking yourself these will significantly increase your ability to get better at naming problems quicker. There's another video where more practice problems have been diagrammed out and discussed. Make sure you watch that one. There are practice problems galore all over the place. If you run out of practice problems uh, on the quiz for this week, you want more practice, you want more practice, and you want more practice, please let me know. I've got plenty of resources that I can give you so that you can practice these kinds of things. Because naming is going to be a fundamental that you will be required to do to be successful at the rest of chemistry for the rest of the semester. Please let me know if you have any questions or concerns about this topic or anything else. And thank you so much for watching this very exhaustive video about naming rules uh, and nomenclature. Have a good day.